Hi, I'm Lori, and today I'm going to be shaving off all of my hair. A woman's hair is such an important sign of femininity in our society, but why? Where did this beauty standard originate? I thought it might have come from a marketing campaign similar to female body hair removal, but it turns out it predates modern advertising by several millennia, and we'll get into that in a minute. As a mom of two, I've been struggling to maintain my very long hair for quite some time. I don't wash it as often as I'd like. I always keep it up, otherwise one of them will surely pull it. I don't have the time or energy to style it anyways, and I keep telling myself I should just cut it. And my justifications for keeping my hair long are so silly. I keep it long because I think that I look better with long hair, even though it's a major inconvenience. Or I tell myself that with my postpartum weight, uh, short hair would only accentuate my rounder face, but that changes today. Well, in today's video, I'm going to take you with me and we're going to give myself a drastic and much needed haircut. And I will be donating my chopped off locks to wigs for kids. And after that, we're going to talk about why long hair is still valued in our society. So stay tuned for more on that. All right, let's go. much better. <laughs> Back to the history of long hair. Many different cultures have different beauty standards and therefore preferred hair lengths for women, but in general, despite a variety of popular hairstyles across cultures and times, women's hair has often predominantly been preferred longer. In the Bible, Paul even says, Doth not nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair it is a shame unto him but if a woman has long hair it is a glory to her thus reinforcing this standard from an evolutionary psychology standpoint experts argue that the length of a woman's hair serves as a display of her fertility and markers of fertility are often associated with beauty being able to grow long healthy hair translates into having a stronger productive system this is also supported by the fact that hair becomes thinner and more fragile as we age according to one article women's hair is also influenced by hormones and estrogen helps support hair growth which is why women's hair tends to grow longer than men's and also why hair growth slows after menopause According to Kurt Sten, author of Hair, A Human History, hair is also very communicative. It allows us to externally display health, sexuality, religiosity, and power. And as Deborah Pergament writes in a research paper, inferences and judgments about a person's morality, sexual orientation, political persuasion, religious sentiments, and in some cultures, socioeconomic status can sometimes be surmised by seeing a particular hairstyle. She also explains how hair can be used as a gender and sexuality signifier and as an indicator of group identity. Her entire paper is riveting. I will link it down below if you want to read it. Hair can also be seen as a communicator of social status. In the 21st century, having well-kept manicured hair is a sign of someone having the time and money to take care of their hair. With the abundance of hair care products, some coming at very hefty price points, having perfect hair is not attainable for everyone. Maintaining a beautiful balayage comes with a big price tag and most trendy haircuts require quite a bit of upkeep. And in today's day and age, long hair is still very much tightly tied to our idea of femininity. I mean, in all reality, a woman's entire appearance is subject to these preconceived idea of femininity and beauty. According to Grandview Research, in 2020, the global hair care market size was 80.81 billion US dollars. It appears to include shampoos, conditioners, and styling and treatment products, but may not actually account for hot tools, brushes, salon products, etc. Black hair care accounts for a large portion of the industry. The history of black hair is very complex and fascinating, but could be a whole video in itself, so I will leave in the description box several videos that are very informative and interesting on the subject. There's actually a whole episode of Blackish dedicated to Diane figuring out her hair and explaining the intricacies of a black girl's hair. Even though black people only make up about a third of the non-white population in America, they account for almost 90% of the spending in the ethnic hair market according to The Economist, and sadly 
sadly, most black hair care businesses aren't even black owned in the US. Black women often report spending thousands of dollars each year on their hair, and statistics show that 80% of black women feel they need to change their natural hair to fit in at work. Studies have found that textured hair can affect a person's wealth, make them the target of oppression, and even affect their health as well. The repeated exposure to chemical present in hair care, salon treatments, and even at home hair care can actually increase people's risk for certain types of cancers. For the longest time, black women were societally pressured to conform with Eurocentric hair standard in order to avoid discrimination. In an episode of Last Week Tonight, John Oliver highlights several instances of workplace discrimination in regards to a black woman's hair. Uh, it will be linked down below if you want to watch it. The Crown Act, which stands for Creating a Respectful and Open World for Natural Hair, aiming at banning hair discrimination, has passed in 18 states and will hopefully become federally recognized someday. With the growing natural hair movement changing the notion of beauty for black women, we are seeing a lot more women wearing their natural hair, which still requires quite a bit of products and upkeep. There are even numerous children's books dedicated to teaching young black kids about loving their hair. Another big part of the hair care industry is hair extensions, wigs, and other human hair products. Initially most popular with black women and Jewish women, it eventually made its way into mainstream consumption with celebrities wearing extensions and wigs for events and performances. The human hair trade is a very unregulated industry and understanding where the hair comes from and everything that goes on behind the scenes is important before participating in that market. It's often very hard to trace the true origins of hair on the market. The main sources of hair used for hair products come from Indian temples where devotees shave their hair in a religious celebration, which is then auctioned off to hair agents by the temple so they can raise money for their communities, as well as from hair brokers who essentially go door to door and buy people's hair in places like Vietnam, or even from comb waste, which is, as it sounds, when people detangle hair discards from brushes and salons to sell it on the hair market. There are also a few websites where you can sell your own hair as well. The industry is worth billions of dollars, with major hair exporters like China exporting over $1 billion in hair in 2019. Although in 2020, the U.S. Customs and Border Protection seized a 13-ton shipment of human hair from China that was likely from forced labor. Emma Tarlow, professor of anthropology and author of Entanglement, explains that often people part with their hair because they need the money. But as some short documentaries and reports show, there are very few ethical sources or good wages. Often women will sell two years worth of growth for less than $10, which won't even last them a month. There is also a whole black market where people have been reportedly being held at gunpoint and people have robbed their hair, for instance, so it's really difficult to source hair ethically. In a Refinery29 video, one business owner in Vietnam is trying to change the industry with his company Remy New York and pays the women he sources his hair from well above market, sometimes hundreds of dollars. All of this in the name of hair, long hair. Clearly, even though long hair as an attractive feature did not originate from a manufacturer need by marketing and advertising, the industry is definitely taking advantage of our evolutionary preferences now. Now let's turn our attention to the history of short haircuts for women. During the wave of women's empowerment in the 20th century, bobs and other shorter hairstyles came in fashion as a way to push back against traditional femininity and as a way to outwardly symbolize women challenging their place in society. They demanded the right to vote, to work, to educate themselves, and to strive for equality. It was also a way for women to deliberately reject normative female sexuality reinforced through centuries of societally upheld beauty standards. In 1908, artist Clara Tice, aka Queen of Greenwich Village, was credited for starting to popularize shorter hairstyles by inspiring her haircut from revolutionary Russian women disguising themselves to fool police. Irene Castle was a dancer who also contributed to the flopper hairstyle around the same time, although it wasn't until Aubrey Hepburn cut her hair for her role in 1953 Roman Holiday that the pixie cut became truly mainstream, according to hair historian Rachel Gibson. 
As Rebecca Jennings reported for RAC, salons would refuse to give women bobs in the early days so they had to do it themselves, go to men's barber shop, or even conspire with their doctors to get diagnosed with hair loss in order to be able to cut their hair. F. Scott Fitzgerald even wrote a story called Bernice Bobs Her Hair to warn women that cutting their hair could turn them into social outcasts. The pixie cut is now a much more popular hairstyle lots of women visit at one point or another in their lives, including lots of celebrities. You may find me rock that hairstyle too when I start growing back my hair. Shaving your hair as a woman is an empowering thing. It's letting go of being defined by the way you look. As Natalie Nietzsche writes in a fashion magazine article, with women's self-worth often tied to our hair, there is a cathartic release in being able to shed that weight, physically and mentally. Numerous celebrities have shaved their heads for roles, while others made the choice to do it for reasons outside of their work. Charlie Theron spoke to Entertainment Tonight about her choice to shave her head for Mad Max and said, Literally just had this moment where I was like, I need to shave my head. I can't think about what I'm going to do with my hair in this movie anymore. I'm going to be in a desert. I'm a new mother. Let's just shave it. The next day we did it. I can't even imagine doing it any other way. Whether it's for work or for fun, these women are helping normalize their hairstyle and make it more socially acceptable. There's even a trend of girls shaving their heads on TikTok now. Now, why did I shave my hair? I feel like as a woman, I have always placed too much self-worth on my hair and, and I really used it to hide behind and appear a certain way. It definitely defined me because I was always the girl with super long hair. I was so attached to it and the couple of times I cut it shorter length, I couldn't wait to grow it back even if it would inevitably end up super tangled and always up in a bun or a ponytail. I decided to finally shave my hair. Well, was it super short? Because as the mom of a toddler and a newborn, I, I don't have time to deal with my hair. I don't have time to style it and I am tired of it always being in the way. It's such a hassle to maintain. Plus, I'm in the full swing of postpartum hair loss right now and already have so much baby hair from my last postpartum period two years ago. I figured it was time to just start from scratch so that when my baby hair grows back in, it will just be the same like that as the rest of my hair. With postpartum hair loss, I'd be shedding hair each time I ran my hand through my hair and I would get the equivalent of multiple Barbie dolls hair each time I brushed it and washed it. I also have been struggling with really bad scalp issues, seborrheic dermatitis, and I have difficulty keeping it under control with so much hair preventing it from breathing and drying properly. Now it finally won't take a whole day for my hair to dry. By shaving my head, I am also giving away my hair to good causes. And lastly, I want to be able to shed this armor I held trying to look normal because, well, fuck beauty standards. I am, however, apprehensive about regrowth because I find hair over my ears, on my forehead and neck like very uncomfortable. That's why I never cut my bangs and always had my hair up. So we'll see what that's going to be like. I was so nervous to cut it and at first I was gonna cut it short length until my sister's wedding in the fall and maybe buzz it then. But after doing the first cut and cutting it a bit shorter than I intended, I decided it was now or never. Especially since I was losing so much hair from postpartum and I was gonna have super annoying regrowth soon. Plus, it's summer and it's really hot, so I am much cooler now. As soon as it was all gone, I felt so relieved. First, that I didn't look completely crazy. I think it actually looks pretty good. And to be honest, it's not that far from what I looked like with a ponytail anyways, minus the crazy baby hair and frizz I can't tame down. And I think it was also such a relief to know that it was one less thing for me to worry about and finally have the most convenient haircut of all time. All I could think was, I can't believe I didn't do this sooner. At first I used a number three guard, but went back a week later and used number two. So this is number two. It's interesting because I did it in part to stop being defined by society's beauty standards and expectations of beauty, but I find myself trying to find ways to self-enhance in other ways, like wearing earrings or applying false lashes or more eye makeup, or even thinking of covering it up with hats and hair wraps or even wigs. And that's kind of counterintuitive when this is supposed to be freeing me from my own internalized idea that I need to be beautiful or that being beautiful matters. Just as I chose to not wear any makeup on a daily basis or choose to wear clothes based on comfort and functionality over fashion. But I keep getting wrapped up in what will people think of me either when I go out in public or when I make videos like this on the internet. So I have to keep reminding myself that I shouldn't care about these things and I should love it because it makes my life easier and makes me happier than my long hair ever did.
So now let's talk about where I will be sending my hair. The ponytails I cut on my first round, I collected and packaged and, and sent to Wigs for Kids, a nonprofit organization that helps children suffering from hair loss stemming from chemotherapy, radiation therapy, alopecia, trichotillomania, burns, and other medical causes. Their work helps to give recipients the self-esteem and self-image they deserve. I also collected the remainder of my hair to donate to Matter of Trust Clean Wave program, which is a really awesome and innovative nonprofit organization that uses ha human hair as well as fur, wool, and fleece, and manufactures felted mat products that soak up petrochemicals in storm drains, wells, filtration systems, rivers, oceans, etc. Most current oil spill cleanups are done using synthetic mats, spraying dispersing chemicals, or even burning the oil in the spill, all of which is very harmful to the environment and even to our health. Since discovering that one kilogram of hair can soak up five times its weight in oil, the creators of those hair mats have been operating the nonprofit organization and have even made the technology open source so anyone who wishes to make use of it can and has even sent out their weaving machines to dozens of partners globally. So yeah, that's the history of long hair and short hair and uh, why I decided to shave my head. What do you think? <laughs> uh, I'm gonna have to deal with it for a really long time, but I'm kind of excited. Uh, it feels very nice. It's extremely hot right now. And so I'm loving it. And I'm so glad that I get to actually send out my hair to help various causes, uh, both the environment and children. Like, what could be better than that? So yeah, let me know what you think of the video and maybe of my hair, although be kind, please. Um, and I will see you all later. Thanks for watching.